beg that I succeed. For I have seen the throne of the gods, and it was empty. Dragon Age. A series about dungeons, ancient prophecies, and well, dragons. But what if I told you that these games were hiding some of the most twisted, horrific, and demented theories and lore you've ever seen? I knew him as Solus, a thoughtful mage obsessed with dreams. But long ago, he had a different name. For those of you that don't know, icebergs are a deep dive into the strangest and most interesting theories and lore in all of our favorite series. But my icebergs are a little different. Instead of briefly looking over hundreds of different theories on a pre-made list, I handpick out the ones I find most interesting or cool and dive deeper into each, along with just talking about general lore for each game. Enjoy. The Grim Anatomy is one of the least well known but also most fascinating finds in all of the Dragon Age universe. The name itself was given to a set of manuscripts that were unearthed during an expedition organized by the University of Orlay into the Western Approach, when they discovered a weird combination of pages and symbols that seemed to be from a man studying animals in the universe, including nugs, giants, and wyverns, and what they looked like deep inside their bodies. Probably over 800 years old and created during the time of the Second Blight, the manuscript is ancient in origin and seems to try to unearth the secrets of something sinister. Where it gets really creepy though is that many pages are full of strange and unrecognizable symbols and scripts that no one in the Dragon Age universe up to this point has been able to decipher. Largely thought to be inspired by the real world Voyage Manuscripts or Grey's Anatomy book, the Grim Autonomy is a dive into the autonomy of different animals in Dragon Age, with many pages delving into the eyes and souls of different animals. One passage even recounts tearing an eye from a giant skull after which the mystery writer exclaims, if the eye is the window through which it crawls, then where in the skull does it hide? What is especially unnerving though is the author's unorthodox methods for investigating these animals, with many dissection techniques that modern scholars of Orlais University see as barbaric. This can be seen on multiple pages full of mutilated corpses and fractured bones that show whoever was taking these notes was especially gruesome in their approach. And as you slowly unwind each page in the manuscripts, the writing becomes more and more incoherent, with increasingly twisted and evil drawings and techniques being put on display, until by the final pages there is nothing left but strange symbols and torn apart pages, implying that someone else or something else, has tried to hide away some of the work being done in this book. It's widely theorized that this something could be a demon itself, considering that the ramblings in the manuscript are most likely a broad and extensive study of demonic possession in animals in the Dragon Age universe, with some especially prominent entries noting things like, it's not wearing the creature's skin, it has become the creature, its mind, its sense, its blood. So could it be that the Grim Anatomy manuscripts are actually the look into a sick and twisted man as he descends into madness, trying to study the effects of demonic possession on life, only to become possessed himself? Some in the community have even begun to wonder if the Grim Anatomy could actually be a collection of notes from one of the seven Tevinter Magisters trying to uncorrupt themselves after returning from the Fade as monsters, or the Architect looking to a side project to help propel the Darkspawn into true domination and rule. Both things will delve into much more detail later on this list. And furthermore, even some have pointed out that the writing style in the manuscript actually very closely resembles many dwarven texts and novels, which could be a clue to its real origin. But either way, something very, very wrong is going on with this manuscript. With so many strange passages and bumbling writing, along with some entries that depict animals and creatures that have never before been seen in the Dragon Age universe. Another passage holds a strange string of weird lines and dots that almost resembles Braille, something I hope some more theorists in the Dragon Age community look into to hopefully shed some more light on the meaning of them. Could it be that the Grim Anatomy actually holds the key to unlocking the secrets behind the demons and the universe and how they use blood and souls to tap into and tarnish our human realm of existence? And if it does, it seems to imply the demons and monsters beyond the Fade and their ability to alter the blood and reality of living creatures is even more drastic than we previously thought, and could have far-reaching implications on the world of Dragon Age and its now decorated past. 
And by the way, make sure to check out a lot of these other creators I mentioned along on this list, like Gil. They have some really great in-depth Dragon Age knowledge, and it's where I learned a lot for this video, and I'm sure you guys will enjoy it as well. While the four main races in Thetis are commonly seen as the humans, elves, dwarves, and Kunari, there actually have been a handful of other less prominent creatures and civilizations that have roamed the lands over multiple millennia. And potentially one of the least well known and also the most interesting of all of these races is the highly mysterious and controversial group of lizardmen called the Scaled Ones. Said to have waged war with the dwarves sometime after the founding of the Tevinter Imperium in minus 1200 ancient, the Scaled Ones have never been seen since, and this has led most scholars across Thetis to write them off as a folk tale entirely. Described as massive humanoids in form, the Scaled Ones were said to be separated between the male warriors with large talons and hardened scales, and the female priestesses that would don colorful and vibrant robes while also having the ability to breathe fire from their nostrils and mouth. The race used a still unknown language and form of communication to quickly command actions across the battlefield, and were said to be a massive problem for sets of dwarven soldiers to handle deep underground. They followed a strict religious doctrine that involved them creating massive golden altars in the middle of the forest that were shaped like fire, where they would drag dead bodies of their foes, drain them of their blood, and perform demonic rituals of presumably blood magic that connected the scaled ones with the elusive realm of the fade. Scholars in the universe to this day still argue over how intelligent this species really was, with some saying they were amongst the beasts themselves, while others argue that there were clear signs of culture. Where this starts to get extremely interesting though, is one entry from the Chronicles of the Forgotten War series books and game, where one dwarf recounts witnessing an unbelievable event take place with the Scaled Ones. A robed Scaled One stood before the altar. Its voice was different from the others, softer, almost feminine. It changed and raised a basin of blood towards the altar, and the other scaled ones bowed. The robed scaled one produced fire from its palm and mouth and ignited the blood. I readied my ace for blood and steeled myself for the sight of the altar, but it wasn't there. The camp, father, and drog, the scaled ones, all gone. Only the basin remained, charred around the edges. This passage seems to imply that the Scaled Ones were performing blood rituals in a sort of attempt to leave the material world and join with powerful demons, or some other event we aren't yet aware of. It actually almost reminds me of the Dwemer in the Elder Scrolls series, another iceberg I made a while back I think you guys would also enjoy, but as to what actually happens to these elusive Scaled Ones, there isn't much to go off of other than this, meaning much of their history is still shrouded in mystique and is still up for interpretation for just how much of it is actually even real in the first place. Where this theory starts to get absolutely unbelievable though, is the real world connection between the Scaled Ones and a horrific event in our real world. Because you see, the original writer for the Scaled Ones lore entries at Bioware was let go a couple of years back because of a connection with a largely unknown satanic worshipping cult called the Scaled Blood Pack, based in Southern California. The cult was indicted on multiple human kidnapping and experimentation cases where they would capture helpless victims at night and experiment on them by attaching reptilian scales from turtles and lizards to human skin in order to build an army of Illuminati lizardmen to take over the- <laughs> I'm just messing with you guys. But by the way, the Scaled Ones really do exist in Dragon Age, and could even potentially be a massive and hidden foe that is sneaking and waiting in the shadows to one day come back and wreak havoc on the world similar to the Darkspawn. The world of Dragon Age is marked by many tremendous moments in history and lore, but as in our own real world, not every region or peoples in the universe agree on when and what exactly has occurred in its long and storied past. This exacerbates the issue of figuring out what really has occurred in the lands of Thetis, the map we play on in-game for those of you who don't know, and one place we can see this more prominently than most is the calendars that are used by the citizens across the lands. By far the most commonly used amongst these calendars in Thetis is the Chantry calendar, which is the main source of timekeeping in every region outside of Tevinter itself, and this calendar marks each age in 100 year spans that now cover over a millennia, which coincidentally for those of you that don't know, is why the series is called Dragon Age in the first place, because in game we play during what is called the Dragon Age of the Chantry calendar, marked by the discovery of dragons existing even after they were presumed extinct 
point up to that point. The Chantry and Dragon Age are a powerful religious force that follow the chant of light religion, that believes in a creator god known as the Maker. But even with all this power, influence, and knowledge, the Tevinter Imperium has their own calendar as well that dates back even 1,000 years prior to the Chantries. But by far the most interesting calendar of all is the now mostly forgotten and forbidden Ancient Elven Calendar. The reason for this is because it marks many important moments in the history of the Dragon Age universe dating back over 8,000 years ago, and holds potentially some of the biggest secrets to some of the long lost forgotten races and fields of magic, many of which in modern times are now banned or removed from history textbooks to stop rumors from spreading. You see, back in the ancient lands of Thetis, there were no humans or Kronari. Rather, the continent was made up of three primary races, the dwarves underground, the titans on ground, and the elves above the sky in floating cities. And most interestingly, the ancient elves, known as the Elven, were said to have lived in a world without boundaries. In Thetis, we know from the games the lands are made up of two regions, the material world you see on this map, and the ephemeral and twisted world of the Fade, which is home to magic and a completely foreign laws to nature, separated from the material world by a field known as the Veil. Side note by the way, magic and otherworldly presences in the series is actually the result of some of the mages gaining power from beyond the veil in the Fade at great risk to themselves. But in the time of the ancient elves, things were different. Instead, the material world and the Fade were as one, and the elves were able to communicate with and channel the power of magic freely. This led the elves to waging a war with the titans and eventually defeating them, mining their bodies which contain the Illyrium minerals we see all over Thetis in game. This victory marked the creation of the elven megacity and capital Arlathon, and the beginning of the elven calendar along with so many other mysteries. And so it's these mysteries that make the elven calendar so interesting. Tales of enormous and magical deities that roam the lands. Huge events explained like the forming of the Evernurus, which was nine elven self-proclaimed gods that led the elven in their victory over the titans. This group of leaders was then said to have waged war with one another, hungry for power, until that cycle was finally broken by an event we will speak about much later on this list. However, what really makes the Elven Calendar so memorable is that all of these recorded events are in many ways in modern Chantry times now seen as nothing more than hearsay, with even the modern day Dalish or Elvish peoples of Thetis seeing many of their old customs as false tales of grandeur. So how much of what the Elvish Calendar describes is real then? Did the ancient elves really have full control and power over the veil? Were the titans defeated single-handedly by them with no other outside forces? And even more so, the calendar also gives dates and explanations for other big events, like when the elven and dwarves first met. In many ways, this ancient calendar is our best first-hand account of what Thetis was actually like millennia ago, and serves as the main source of knowledge of the past upon which the characters in the game have built. More than potentially any other calendars or documents in game, the elven historical markers may paint some of the backstory for some of the most riveting and mind-altering lore in all of Dragon Age, and lots of players might not even know about it. While nowadays in the Dragon Age games, most of proper civilization and power is focused in the hands of humanity, with elves and dwarves seeing a secondary role, the question of how humans even came to the lands of Thetis in the first place and established such a stronghold is still shrouded in a lot of mystery. We know that at some point humanity arrived to the north near the Tevinter Imperium, sailing on an armada of large ships carrying at the time one massive nomadic tribe of humans known as the Neuraminians. The leading theory is that the first human clan originated from the close northern island of Parvolan, and this is corroborated by two main pieces of evidence. First of all, modern day expeditions to Parvolan have uncovered massive pyramids and other human made structures deep in the rainforest of the island. And even more incriminating, many documents of the ancient elven lore and now Dalish customs claim explicitly that this is exactly where humanity stemmed from. And after all, we do know from both elven and dwarven lore stemming back thousands of years that both the civilizations lived on Thetis without humans at some point. So the elven knowing where humanity came from would in theory make sense. The issue is we already know ancient Dalish or elven lore is in many cases very unreliable, and it's hard to decipher what is truth from fiction. What we do know is that after these first humans arrived in Thetis, they quickly started to gain power and war with their neighboring elves. 
That is, until the modern day Thetis we play in the games, where humanity has now garnered control of the entire continent, splitting into seven different realms of power and influence ruled over by humanity. The Andrefels to the northwest, the mage societies of the Tevinter Imperium and the original landing spot for humanity, the northeastern kingdoms of Adiva and Ravain, the more sporadic strongholds of Navera and the Free Marches, and the affluent yet distinct zones of Orle and Ferelden. By the way, for anyone who's interested, Dragon Age Origins and Dragon Age 2 take place mostly in Ferelden, and Dragon Age Inquisition covers primarily the zones between Orle, Ferelden, and the Free Marches. The newly announced sequel, Dragon Age Dreadwolf, is rumored to be set in the Tevinter Imperium. However, it's still the origins for humanity that are the cause for so much rumor and speculation. Some elven texts even argue that humanity was actually first born on Seheron, and only migrated to Parvolan after, after which they made landfall on Thetis. But even crazier theories argue maybe humanity actually comes from somewhere much further, and much more unknown. As to what these lands would actually be like, it's hard to say, as nothing beyond the standard maps of Thetis has been extensively explored due to vast oceans and treacherous conditions. But even crazier theories yet that we can speculate on may paint an even more gruesome picture. It's widely documented that early humans on the continent of Thetis in the Tevinter Imperium worshipped the Old Gods, which were said to be dragon lords. And we also know that humans can consume dragon blood, and it changes them, but keeps them alive, implying that maybe humanity's origins actually come from the dragon old gods as slaves to their will. After all, it seems that the main reason that humanity was able to beat the elven in warfare so quickly was because of the magic the old gods had taught them. Another plausible explanation in a similar vein is Mithal. Mithal was one of the original elven Evernuris, who was said to have taken down a titan all on her own but we also know she had a huge interest in early humanity for some reason. Many ancient lore texts argue that the elven of old would experiment and concoct many strange new species and monsters in their pursuit of control of the world, and humanity could have somehow originally stemmed from these experiments, being subjugated in elven rule, which was written out of the history books in a shame for their past. Questions as to what humanity's origins are get even weirder when we look at the Kunari, who are also said to have sailed from some northern land. One prominent Chantry scholar who studied geography even argued there must be other lands, continents or islands, perhaps across Amaranthine or north of Parvolan, for the Kunari arrived in Thetis from somewhere. But beyond that deduction, we know nothing. So it seems likely that there's lots of mysteries and important things happening outside of the continent of Thetis itself. And as to what lies in the north, it may just be the key to understanding what exactly the ancient history of the world is. Because the humans, elves, and dwarves alike all have their own tales, but it is only by actually venturing into the unknown lands that we could learn more. One of the most thought-provoking and interesting riddles in all Dragon Age, and potentially one we will learn more about in Dreadwolf, seeing as it's situated closer to the north. Probably the most terrifying foe and force we have gone up against in the Dragon Age series so far is the Darkspawn. Introduced in Dragon Age Origins, Darkspawn are heinous monstrosities that live deep underground and periodically surface to try and put an end to the world, led by a song and will of the old gods that drives their thirst for bloodshed, known as the Taint. The way they do this is first by discovering an old god deep underground and tainting the dragon with their blood in order to turn it into an archdemon, which then leads the never-ending horde of darkspawn to the surface world to create chaos. For some more background on this too, the ancient humans that originally migrated to the Tevinter Imperium worshipped the Maker, or god of the now Chantry's religion, and it is taught that the old gods were banished underground by the Maker for disobeying their commands. And in this society of Tevinter, there were seven high magistrates of powerful mages, each representing one of the seven old gods or dragons. But on one fateful day, these seven magisters combined their powers and teleported themselves into the Fade, something humanity had never done before. And in their own hubris, they were transformed into diseased and mindless monsters, the first of the Darkspawn. And when they arrived back to Thetis, they spread this plague to many others and created hordes of darkspawn now led by the first released old god, Dumat. This event was known as the First Blight, and as with all others preceding it, it led to years and years of horrific bloodshed and death, with the skies blackened and storming nonstop. All human civilizations on Thetis had to band together in order to finally slay the dragon and put an end to the Blight. And since then, there have been four more blights, with the fifth taking place during the events of Dragon Age Origins, and none happening since. 
because in Dragon Age Inquisition, we fight demons, not Darkspawn. Where the interesting theories start to come in though, is what exactly is going to happen once there is no longer any Blights. Currently, the Darkspawn are still living deep underground beneath Thetis after their last defeat, and are constantly looking for one of the two remaining old gods' bodies in order to taint and release the new Archdemon. But what exactly would happen if the Darkspawn succeeded in doing so, and these next two Blights end up being stopped as well? Some in the community have begun to speculate that this could actually lead to catastrophe, seeing the seven old gods as a sort of seal and protection for the world. Could it be that by slaying all of the archdemons, and thus all of the old gods, humanity would actually be dooming themselves to an even more hellish existence? Potentially these old gods are in some way holding back a more sinister foe, either the Evanuris in conjunction with the Veil, or maybe the ancient and long forgotten titans that once warred with the god Elven. Maybe the very thing that humanity fears most, that being the Darkspawn and their Blight invasions, is actually somehow their salvation. We already know that the world of Thetis is hiding a lot more secrets than meets the eye, and potentially these old gods deep underground are the only things standing between us and something much, much scarier. Only time will tell though, as it's usually centuries between each Darkspawn invasion, and seeing as the amount of old gods left is dwindling, it will be harder and harder for them to find one. While most of the Dragon Age discussions seem to revolve around the humans, and especially the elves, potentially the most interesting race, the dwarves, are hiding what seems to be some of the best lore and theories in the whole series. Rumored to have been birthed from the titans themselves, the ancient dwarves of old are now shrouded in mystery as to what exactly they even were. But what is known is that the ancient dwarves were extremely powerful and formidable beings. At some point after the fall of the titans, likely due to the Evanuris or elven gods, the dwarven race somehow fell with them, and deep underground started to construct what are called the tigs or dwarven settlements beneath the surface. With the fall of the titans too, their blood tainted the rocks, and from it the dwarves found control over Illyrium, and from that grew an unrelenting resistance to magic. And by the way, this was also the reason they eventually were able to ally with the Deventer Empyrean humans, as the mages needed access to more Illyrium to pull magic from the Fade. And as more and more of these tigs started to crop up at different spots underground, the dwarves began to band together into one dwarven empire with its capital at Cal Shirok. The capital many years later was moved to Orzammar instead, but nonetheless, these forgotten capitals and tigs now litter the underground portions of Thetis, some with terrifying backstories and lore of crazy creatures and horrific events involved with many, while others are completely now forgotten to the winds of time. And in order to connect these tigs and massive underground capitals, the dwarves constructed a sprawling underground network of highways called the Deep Roads. These massive sections of underground caverns stretch for miles and miles throughout the darkest and most horrifying depths of Thetis, and are also the original spot where many dwarves first encountered the Darkspawn. Because you see, during the starting stages of the First Blight, many travelers and caravans on the Deep Roads started to disappear, along with guard patrols sent to find them, and rumors of shadowy beings and blood-curdling screams began to sweep the dwarven mindshare. It turned out these disappearances were in fact due to the Darkspawn, coming from deep underground, and this first blight is actually what resulted in the dwarven race itself being as weak as they are now in the games as we see them. As they lost almost all of their tigs and capitals to non-stop warfare with the beasts, holding on only due to their ingenuity in crafting, forging, and building. If humanity and elves thought they had it bad on the surface, it was only ten times worse for the dwarves underground. But just because the modern day dwarves are so much weaker and now less expansive, does not mean that they do not have a rich and storied history in their past with the most extensive writing of any race, writings that we'll dive into deeper on this list. For the Deep Roads specifically though, the thing that made the dwarves so notable and powerful in the first place, some in the community have begun to wonder whether or not the dwarves we know of today even constructed them. We know from many lore entries in game that the dwarves of these primeval and ancient tigs were said to have worshipped strange characters and beings that gave them immense power after the fall of the titans. One of the most notable examples of this comes from an ancient report found in the royal archives of Orzammar that reads, Your Majesty, it's difficult getting a straight answer out of the scavenger. These sods get themselves so blighted they can't think straight, much less spit in their own mouths. He says, however, that he's gone down into the parts of the deep roads that are so old that our people forgot them long before the blight even happened. He spoke of great statues and temples. Temples. 
He spoke of things that could only have been made of magic and of impossible ruins untouched by the darkspawn. He described creatures the likes of which we've never seen. None of it's possible, of course. But V conferred with the Shaper and he says the memories date back to the founding of the first Hive. What could have been before that? Yes, we're unable to explore those depths the scavenger spoke of because of the darkspawn, but surely the memories would speak of such places if they existed. Yet, in the scavenger's belongings, amidst all the filth, there was a single idol. It was clearly of dwarven make, but not resembling any paragon on record. The idol was dressed in a manner I've never seen. The shaper of memories also could not identify the substance from which it was made. The thought that the memories might be wrong is unsettling. Could it be that these strange beings are something we have never seen before? Or perhaps a being that we are well aware of like the Evanuris or the Magistrates? Potentially most of the deep roads may actually have been constructed before the dwarves started their great tigs underground, and it was only after communicating with these beings that they were able to add on to them and take control of the underground. If this is the case though, then what is it that the dwarves stumbled upon that gave them so much power? Surely deep underground there are more dwarven archives and ruins that can be found in lost tigs, and it could also hold the key to a force in Dragon Age that we aren't yet aware of yet that could be harnessing some of the most immense power and knowledge we have ever seen. Either way, it's crazy to think that while most of the series in the games takes place on land, there's also an entire network of advanced and long lost civilizations right beneath our feet that hold the keys to the deepest and darkest mysteries in the entire series. Another popular topic for debate in the Dragon Age universe is where exactly do the Kunari stem from? It's been hinted at multiple times in game from different lore entries and character discussions with the Iron Bull specifically that the Kunari are actually descendants of a much more ancient race or set of people called the Kossith. The Kossith were said to have arrived in Ferelden sometime before the First Blight, and it is actually the Kossith themselves that apparently transformed into ogres we fight in game when the Darkspawn tainted their blood. We know about this ancient and mysterious race from some hints in game and out of game, like from a Bioware developer that in a forum post said the Kossith predated the Kunari from those across the sea. And what would you know, there's a lore entry in Dragon Age Inquisition that has the exact same name and reads, it's clear someone has an interest in the Inquisition, someone organized, with ties to those from across the sea. We've eliminated the Kunari as the most obvious suspects. Nonetheless, knowing they're there does not tell us who they are, what they're doing, or why. They're clever, we know that, and they have resources. So it's pretty clear then that the Kossith did in fact exist, and came from somewhere northeast of Thetis. But the question still remains of how exactly did the Kunari stem from the Kossith then in the first place? We know that Kunari themselves follow a strict doctrine called the Kun, and if they stray from it even slightly can become enraged and lose themselves, almost like a rabid dog bred for war. Well, what if that's because that is exactly what the Kunari actually are? Nothing more than a twisted science experiment to create a killing machine of sorts. Here, take a listen to some of the dialogue surrounding this from Dragon Age Inquisition. You know, Kunari hold dragons sacred. Well, as much as we hold anything sacred. <laughs> Atashi. The Glorious Ones. That's our word for them. Atashi. Why do you think the Kunari think of dragons that way? Well, you know how we have horns. We kind of look more dragony than most people. Maybe it's that. But a few of the Ben Hasrath have this crazy old theory. See, <clears throat> the Tamasrans control who we mate with. They breed us for jobs like you'd breed dogs or horses. What if they mixed in some dragon a long time ago? What do they call you? A Kunari? Your blood is engorged with decay. Your race is not a race. It is a mistake. So could it be that the Kunari are actually Kossith mixed from the blood of dragons? That would explain why the Iron Bull and all Kunari feel a connection to them, and also would tie into Corypheus' speech regarding them being a mistake. And even more so, think about it. This weird connection wouldn't be all that weird in Dragon Age. After all, we know elf blood mixed with dragon blood can create elven gods like Flemeth, and that mixing darkspawn blood with that of a dragon creates an archdemon. So could it be that the mixing of the blood of a dragon with that of a Kossith 
actually results in a Kunari, a fierce and dragon-looking humanoid that most strictly follows a Kuhn code or risks becoming unstable. In my mind, this theory is as good as confirmed, but the question of how exactly this even happened is still up in the air. It could have been the magistrates experimenting on elven Kossith slaves, or it could have been elven researchers mixing blood samples. It's hard to say. But either way, it's a lore point I would love to see be explored more in upcoming games. The Grey Wardens are one of Dragon Age's most important military forces, and the reason for this is they are one of the main warriors that in the times of the Blight fight back against the Darkspawn and risk their lives in order to slay the Archdemons and save the surface world from the Hellish Spawn. The Order was originally founded during the First Blight in order to fight back, and ever since, they have been recruiting any and all volunteers across Thetis into the Order to help them wage war when needed. Because this Order does not discriminate against any race or peoples, it's common that many subjugated civilians like City Elves will seek to join in order to find a sense of purpose and fairness in their lives where otherwise there was none. But the scariest part about the Order is actually some of its most closely guarded secrets that many outsiders don't know fully about. The most notable of these is the actual ritual that one must undergo to actually become a Grey Warden, where an individual must drink from a goblet of Darkspawn blood mixed with a drop of Archdemon blood. Darkspawn blood on its own will kill most people, and mixed with a drop of blood from the Archdemon itself can result in one of the most harrowing experiences a person can undergo. And it's only those that survive this twisted ritual that are deemed strong enough to actually join the Order. And from that point on, after drinking the blood, each member can now sense Darkspawn and Archdemons and becomes especially adept at fighting them. But while in the original Dragon Age game, these Grey Wardens play a very pivotal role in the main story, in the more modern days of Dragon Age Inquisition, that isn't the case. One of the main secondary plots in Inquisition is the idea of, where have all the Grey Wardens even gone? While you can have one join your team and meet a couple others, usually they have dialogue lines alluding to the fact that they don't know where all of the other Grey Wardens have gone or what they're doing as of late. Some of the community have begun to speculate that many Grey Wardens may actually be in hiding, waiting for a secret sixth blight that is about to ravage the world. Could something like this come into play in Dragon Age Dreadwolf? And if it does, could it result in the famed Order of the Grey Wardens coming back once again in full force to save the world? After all, the leaders of the Order must be up to something after all this time in game we aren't seeing most of them. In time, we will surely figure out, but the even crazier and wild potential secret about the Grey Wardens that we can dive into right now is one that might have been under our noses the whole time. You see, we know that the Order was originally formed during the First Blight in order to combat the Darkspawn, but as to how exactly they were formed is hard to say. Some leading theories actually posit that the original formation came from the Seven Magisters of the Tevinter Imperium. But why would that be the case, you might ask? Well, that's where this gets really interesting. Because we know that one of the main goals of the Seven Tevinter Magisters was to usurp the Old Gods. It's why each of the Seven represented one of the Old Gods themselves, and why they all committed to the second sin of joining together physically into the Fade, the original cause of the First Blight or so it's argued in the Chantry and from the Maker. So if we know these Magisters had a vested interest in killing or taking over the Old Gods, wouldn't they then be the obvious ones who would create an order that sole goal was killing them? After all, remember that those Archdemons that the Darkspawn summoned from deep underground to lead them are actually the seven Old Gods that were banished underground by the Maker at least if we believe what the Chantry tells us. Regardless of whether you believe the Maker and Chantry though, we do know for a fact that the Magisters wanted to overpower the Old Gods, and that the Grey Wardens are doing so by killing the Archdemons, meaning the Tevinter Magisters may be the perfect fit for the secret behind the founding of the Grey Wardens. And if this theory is actually true, it may get even crazier, because we know from some lore documents in game that the Tevinter Magisters would be said to have the ability to jump bodies, with some reports in ancient Warden text slabs reporting similar things from the first Warden himself. So could it be that the first Grey Warden was actually a Tevinter Magister, that has now over the years been jumping from one body to the next, leading the Order in an all-out war against the Darkspawn, under the guise that they are saving the world, when really, they're just trying to kill all the old gods, in order to create a power vacuum for the original Magisters? In my opinion, it's one of the coolest theories the Dragon Age community in recent times has latched onto, and I really hope Bioware can at least hint at this being sort of true in future games.
With the Chantry now being one of the predominant forces on Thetis in terms of influence through their belief in the Maker and Might in terms of the Templars, they are one of the strongest entities in the modern day Dragon Age world. And one of their most revered figures of belief is the former mortal bride and prophet to the Maker himself, Andraste. Said to be a mortal woman who suffered great hardship at an early age, including the death of her family and kidnapping via the Tevinter armies, Andraste after her release went on to pray in the woods every night until one day the Maker answered. From this moment onward, Andraste started to spread the word of the Maker far and wide, and began to lead different rebel or faction groups in an uprising of faith. This even included many great figures joining her cause like Shartan, who led a group of elves and in many other theories is argued that he may in fact be the Dreadwolf or Solus himself, trying to help out Andraste in her master plan. And from this newfound power, Andraste was able to free most of the lands of Thetis until one faithful day when one of her adversaries betrayed her, resulting in her capture and death at the hands of Tevinter's soldiers. But after the Tevinter leader Mafarath had driven his sword through Andraste and killed her, he had a sudden realization that he did in fact believe that she was the chosen prophet, and that the words of the Maker were true. He even later wrote about this in a journal entry that ended with these words. And she came to me in a vision, and laid her hand on my heart. Her touch was like fire that did not burn, and by her touch I was made pure again. Despair not, she said, for your betrayal was maker blessed, and returned me to his side. I am forgiven. So this in part resulted in Tevinter taking on the gospel of the Maker as well, but in actuality Andraste is one of the most hotly debated and theorized topics in all of Dragon Age, with seemingly endless lore and arguments to be made. Some in the community think that Andraste never even actually existed, and is merely a story told by the Chantry in order to make people believe in the faith of the Maker, while others argue that there's too much historical archives referencing her to write her off entirely. Other theories postulate that the elven Evanuris' very own Mythal may actually be Andraste, or Andraste's mother. This stems from the fact that, first of all, we don't even know if the Maker really exists. So were those visions that Andraste had in the forest of the Maker actually him? Or could it have been Mithal disguising herself as some sort of other deity? After all, we know Mithal was said to only have offspring that were daughters, and from all accounts of Andraste as well, all of her offsprings were only daughters too, and no sons. An interesting coincidence for sure. On top of this, both of their stories are similar, with Mithal also crying out to a force to save her when she felt weak as well. Their journeys are almost exact parallels of one another. Could it be that the story of Andraste is actually just a re-remembering of the life of Mithal herself that has now been co-opted in an attempt to lend credence to the idea that the Maker does truly exist? Maybe ancient human civilization in Dragon Age borrowed from some of the ancient Elven lore they saw before discarding it after all. But overall, maybe the most weird part about Andraste is just her connection with the Maker. Before her, the Maker wasn't even really talked about on Thetis, with the human tribes worshipping their own gods and the Tevinter Imperium the seven old gods of ancient past. So for Andraste to just come in out of nowhere and announce that the most powerful being in the universe had spoken out to her, and that for the first time is making himself known, just seems kind of suspect to me. And the deeper you look into this mystery, the more and more it seems like something weird is going on here. There's a lot more than meets the eye. It calls into question the very existence of the Maker himself, or at least the version we know him as today. And for me personally, I think the Maker could actually be a veil behind which something much more unbelievable is going on, that we likely will never get the actual true answers to. While the lands of Thetis and Dragon Age offer some of the best lore and mysteries in any game, some would argue that the enigma of what lies outside of these known locations is even more intriguing. And one of these locations we have only heard small rumors of is the lands to the east of the Amaranthine Sea. Rumored to be devoid of any sentient species, all of Theodosian attempts of colonization of the Eastern Front have resulted in splendid failure. But despite this, some legends still remain that tell of lands with massive former settlements the likes of which Thetis has never seen, with gold-plated structures that reach into the heavens and buildings the size of entire valleys. Most strange of all though, the survivors of these expeditions that did make landfall apparently found that there was no one else in these structures, and quickly went mad with some unknown virus before clawing their own eyes and faces apart. This horrific gossip has made further expeditions across the Amaranthine mostly a fool's errand, but that doesn't mean we haven't come into contact with beings that apparently are from the east. First of all, we already know that the Kossith likely stem from eastern lands originally, meaning there is something out there for sure. 
but even more damning in Dragon Age Inquisition, we actually can receive a report at the war table if certain conditions are met that reads, Three outposts on the Navarian border were found abandoned with no signs of struggle and nothing destroyed or taken. But in every camp, this message. We hold your Inquisition in high esteem. Thetis's present troubles are great, but you have the strength to meet and conquer them. More will come. We prepare for the day and hold vigil. Do not look for your men. Do not mourn them. They have given themselves of their own free will to a higher cause. This begs the question though, if some unknown eastern force has somehow convinced our soldiers to join their side instead, what could possibly be more important to them than the journey we're on in game? After all, the soldiers in the Inquisition are under the belief that they're fighting for essentially the next Andraste figure in history for their god maker against a foe of unstoppable power. So either something even more unbelievable and crazy is happening to the east of Thetis, or a force is slowly starting to kidnap people and take them to a land full of unknown disease and abandoned megacities. Either one of these are really fascinating, and while neither will likely be explored fully in a new game, I hope future entries can at least shed some more light on what's beyond Thetis itself. Depending on who you ask, Sarah is either one of the best or worst companions in Dragon Age Inquisition. She has a personality that you either love or despise, and in combat provides some useful utility as a rogue that packs a punch. But while on the surface Sarah is nothing more than a happy-go-lucky and capable ally, there actually may be a lot more to her than we originally thought. Many players noticed that throughout their playthrough in Inquisition, Cole and Sola specifically had lots of dialogue lines directed to Sarah, talking to her about the Fade and the spirit world, as well as her backstory, which is especially interesting given that Cole and Solas have a special connection to everything. So why would they be so keen on questioning Sarah then? Well, one clue to the answer may lie in the tarot card that we see after completing her personal loyalty quest in-game. You see, after completing each companion's personal quest in Dragon Age Inquisition, the player receives one of these cards full of artwork and of the companion. But in Sarah's case, the card we get has a very striking resemblance to Andril's Valislin. For those of you that don't know, in Dragon Age, a Valislin is blood riding, or in other words, facial tattoos that elves don in order to embrace others. Andril has special significance here because she was said to be the daughter of one of the leaders of the ancient elven pantheon, or Evanuris. So could it be the reason that Cole and Solus are so interested in Sarah is because she is actually a daughter of some great elven gods? Another weird oddity about Sarah is that her body is very different from that of most elves. She is taller, stockier, and very so much so that she's actually unable to wear elven armor in game, instead opting for human garments instead. The reason this is significant is because the only other elves we know of that have similar body types to this are the ancient elven of the Pantheon's heydays, as we see from Solas having broader shoulders, and also in the Well of Sorrows when seeing an Evanuris, it is given a human body model in the game files not in elves. Which, side note, could potentially mean that the ancient elves were actually humans, and that's where humanity originally came from, especially given Bioware has used human models for other Evanuris in-game. But I digress. It seems quite clear that what is being implied here is that Sarah is in fact Andril, or some other ancient and powerful elven. Or, we are looking way too deep into this. But either way, something more is going on than meets the eye with Sarah for sure and it may even be that she has more magical powers than we could ever imagine, that are being suppressed from her childhood, powers that Solus and Cole are interested in figuring out. Titans are one of the most interesting parts of the Dragon Age lore, but sadly, at the time period we're in today, it's seldom we ever actually get to see or converse with one. The only instance where we actually do get to interact with a Titan in game that we know of is from the Dragon Age Inquisition Descent DLC, and it's here we learn much about the ancient past of the dwarves and how the Titans seem to have made them forget some of their inscribed memories, even at the capital of Orzammar. It's also implied here in some character dialogue that the Titans were the ones that potentially carved out the deep roads themselves, and it also explains why the roads themselves are so massive compared to standard dwarf stature. Where things start to get really fascinating though is a note we can find on the ground of the main questline of Inquisition in the raw fade titled, Whispers Written in Red Lyrium. We are here. We have waited. We have slept. We have sundered. We are crippled. We are polluted. We endure. We wait. We have found the dreams again we will awaken. This short yet haunting note is an obvious nod to the titans deep below Thetis, and is implying that these long lost beasts are close to waking up. As to what this would mean for the entire continent of Thetis, the ramifications could be enormous. 
After all, we know the Titans waged a bloody war with the ancient Elven already, and were said to be the original keepers of Thetis itself. We also know that there are many strange things going on with the Titans, like the fact that deep underground they have access to large areas that look like the sky, that dwarves are afraid of falling into. Could it be that the dragons and gods of ancient lore that were said to inhabit the sky were actually in this weird realm? And if that's the case, if the titans are about to awaken from their deep slumber, now crippled and polluted, will they be bringing back the nightmares of Thetis past with them, unleashing the deepest and darkest secrets that the Dragon Age series has to offer? It certainly would tie well into Dragon Age 4, a game centered around Solus bringing back the past, but either way, something crazy is about to happen with the titans. And judging on the little we have seen so far in the lore and games, it probably won't be good. The world of Dragon Age and Thetis at its core revolves around the Fade, the mysterious and ephemeral land that consists of raw and unwieldy power that can be siphoned off into the material world at its own will. At the center of this power vacuum lies the Black City, and atop its thrones whoever sits takes the power of Thetis itself it is said. But what if that wasn't the case? What if the Fade in a way was a mind of its own? playing tricks on all of those who vie for its power, in its own sick game. In some of the writings of Andraste, we can find this entry. Here lies the abyss, the well of all souls. From these emerald waters doth life begin anew. Come to me, child, and I shall embrace you. In my arms lies eternity. And lo and behold, in Dragon Age Inquisition, we do have the chance to find one of these Well of Souls, which beckons those looking for power to come and embrace its waters, only to subjugate their mind to its own will. It's a similar process to the taint for the Darkspawn that binds them to the will of the Old Gods, but that makes us begin to wonder. If the Old Gods used to live amongst the world of the Fate itself, and the taint is the blood of the Dragon Old Gods, could the taint itself actually be similar to what is happening with the Well? Or in other words, could the Fade itself be pulling the strings behind everything going on, bending the will of all of those who take its blood or sacrifice, which would include the Old Gods, Solus, the Evanuris, and more? It's an interesting theory for sure, and would imply that there is in fact no throne that sits atop the golden or black city of the Fade, but rather it's a red herring meant to trick power-hungry individuals into their own slavery to the will of an unknown maker. It would also explain the importance of blood in the Dragon Age series, as any forms of tainted blood could be nothing more than the Fade's grasp over the material world being shown, and also shows why in Andrasse's writings she beckons us to the wells, because she is at the will of the maker, or in actuality, the Fade, who aims to enslave all. To the west of the Anderfels region in Dragon Age lies the Volca Sea, a location not frequently talked about in games, but one that may be hiding some of the most interesting secrets in the entire series. We know that until around the Black Age of the Chantry Calendar, the Ander city of Laesh was said to be trading with mysterious and unknown ships that came from across the Volca Sea. These concealed traders were rumored to don horrific masks hiding their faces, and they were affectionately given the name the Voshai by the people of the Anderfels. These Voshai had an extreme interest specifically in Lyrium, and traveled great distances to trade and obtain as much as possible. It was also said that all of these Voshai ships were captained specifically by dwarven-like people, with no reports of any elvish adjacent inhabitants ever being sighted. News of these people began to spread throughout the lands of Thetis, and even resulted in some large-scale Tevinter expeditions taking place, but each and every one of them disappeared as soon as they ventured into the Volca Sea, never to be seen again. Smaller bands of warriors and adventurers have also tried their hand at crossing the sea and discovering the lands of the Voshai, but all have failed. This has resulted in a lot of people around the sea beginning to think that it is in fact cursed, but that starts to make us ask the question, cursed by what? And even more so then, how are the Voshai making their way across? These questions have now gone unanswered for hundreds of years as the Voshai seemingly disappeared as quickly as they came, with no more of the mystery race coming to trade for some time. Well. That is until recently, where rumors have once again began to crop up and tell of the Voshai's return to the Anderfels, this time bearing tales of something unbelievable. 
Some reports have come out that the Voshai are screaming about some sort of massive cataclysm that has occurred, and that they're seeking refuge. But what exactly is this cataclysm going on? And does it tie in with the reason the Volca Sea is so hard to navigate in the first place? Could it have something to do with the lyrium that the Voshai came to buy when they first crossed over? After all, we know lyrium in Dragon Age has very magical properties that originate from the Titans themselves. And if these Voshai are very dwarf-like as they have been described, could they in fact be descendants of the original dwarves that inhabited Thetis before the fall of the Titans, when it was said that both of them were combined? If any of this is true, it could hold the keys to unlocking some of the biggest mysteries of the ancient lore in Dragon Age, and also would give us a great idea of what life was like outside of Thetis itself, potentially telling us about a bigger threat than we have ever seen, causing cataclysm everywhere on the planet. It's a story we'll likely never know the full backstory behind, but one I would love to have even a small amount of updates on in future games. In the world of Dragon Age, each race and civilization worships their own gods and deities, with their own rich history and lore, and also all with their very own splinter factions and groups. For the humans, these main higher ones are the Maker and the Old Gods, and for the Elves, it's the ancient pantheon of the Evanurus along with the Forgotten Ones. But what if the Old Gods and the Evanurus weren't actually all that different? You see, we already know that Solus or Fen Harel doomed the ancient Elven by creating the Veil and removing their Fade magic from the Material Realm. And it was only after this that humankind first made landfall on the continent of Thetis, bringing with them the traditions of the Maker Old Gods and the first established capital of Tevinter. And from those traditions, we also know that the seven magistrates of Tevinter doomed us all by committing the second sin and traveling into the Fade, which resulted in the Blight coming forth from their realm into our own. But what if this was all planned, and not by the old gods of human tradition, but by the ancient Evanurus of the Elves? Listen to this line of dialogue from Dragon Age Inquisition. Solus, the dragon Corythius commands, could it truly be an archdemon? One assumes that if it were, we would be facing a blight. So what is it then? A corrupted dragon? Simply another darkspawn? It is connected to Corythius. Such a relation goes beyond mere control. It is a bond. It makes you wonder if that's all the archdemons themselves are, pets to beings who no longer exist. I would not go as far as that. This dragon is a replica, spawned from a creature who aspires to greatness. No more. Could it be that the old gods, or dragons and archdemons, are actually puppets for the Evernurus? What if after Solus trapped the Evernurus behind the veil, he also knew they would likely try to escape at one point? Maybe the old gods from humanity's traditions are nothing more than the Evernurus disguising themselves as dragons in order to gain our favor. That would explain the Blight as well, because Solus being the cunning individual he is would have anticipated something like this. So when humanity tried to free the Evanurus from their prison, thinking they were talking to the Maker and Old Gods, Solus had also hidden the Blight in the Fade, thus releasing it onto humanity and forcing them to fight and kill the Archdemons, which would in turn kill the Evanurus' power. This theory gets a lot more interesting too when we realize that there are seven Old Gods in human tradition, but also seven Evanurus in the Elven Pantheon when we take away Fen Harel and Mithal, who were both said to not be like the others. So maybe the gods of humanity's beginnings in Dragon Age are nothing more than the ancient elven warriors and deities that are speaking to us from beyond the Fade in an attempt to get another race to free them from the prison that Solus has damned them to. It's an awesome theory for sure, and if true, shows that the elves really are pulling the strings behind everything happening in Thetis. And while I understand why so many Dragon Age fans find elven lore to be too all-encompassing, I love the idea of some something like this, and how it could tie the entire world and all gods together into one much more explainable thing. Liliana is one of a handful of characters we see in every single Dragon Age game, but what makes her especially interesting is that she also is one we can kill in the first game, Dragon Age Origins. The reason this is so peculiar though is because regardless of whether we actually kill her or not, she always shows up in the next two games. And in Dragon Age Inquisition specifically, we'll even remark how she is not sure how she came back to life if you did indeed kill her in the first game. While this is most likely a retcon by Bioware to bring back a character into the main story that players could have killed early on, the in-lore explanation is a lot more intriguing. You see, what a lot of players don't know is that at the end of the Dragon Age Inquisition Trespasser DLC, the following ending credits can be seen if Leliana never became divine. 
Eventually, Leliana became distant and contemplative, often secluding herself in the rookery with none but her ravens for company. One morning, the residents of Skyhold awoke to a great beating of wings and a vast cloud of ravens blotting out the sky above the fortress. Those who investigated found both the rookery and Leliana's chambers vacant, with only a single message left as explanation. The lyrium sank thought into being. Now time is tale, and the melody is called elsewhere. Until I am needed, I am free. Something really strange is going on here. This last message left by Leliana seems to imply that she might be some sort of lyrium mind monster, and would explain how she was able to simply vanish without a trace. And the theory only gets crazier from here, too. If we go back to Dragon Age Origins where it all started, some may remember the quest called In Hushed Whispers, where if Leliana has not been killed yet by the player, we can learn a story about how she was tortured and experimented on due to her extreme resistance to red lyrium and blight. We can read passages in this section that talk about how the scientists of the time were fascinated with her immense abilities and could not figure out what was going on with her. Furthermore, in the Leliana Song DLC, at one point, Leliana starts to hear voices in her head, after surviving a wound that should have killed her, instead releasing a flurry of talking heads that tell her, fight for those who can't. Something a sleeper agent would be told. And finally, in the World of Thetis Volume 2 lore book collection, we can find this entry. In Leliana's most vivid memory of her early childhood, she sees herself, a child of little more than four, holding her mother's hand as they stand on the stone terrace of an Orlesian villa, looking out at the cresting waves of the waking sea. Behind them are gardens of sweet orange and lavender, but the only fragrance that stands out to Leliana is the gentle scent of her mother's grey linen dress. These days, Leliana is unsure if the moment is real or merely imagined, but cherishes it nonetheless as it were one of the few images she retains of her Ferelden mother. Could it be that the reason that Liliana is so resistant to Lyrium, the reason she seemingly comes back to life after dying, and the reason she has such a hazy memory of her past is because she's actually a mindless husk controlled by Lyrium, simply set forth into the world to accomplish the task of someone else as a puppet. Liliana was never actually born. She simply is a mindless body that has been infused with fake memories from Lyrium. It perfectly explains all the oddities with the character, and may mean that Titans or some other force are using her for something we aren't aware of yet. And considering she's part of the highest ranks of the Inquisition at the time when we play, would have access to the most top secret information available, and that may just come back to bite us in future games. There are many strange and ominous locations in the world of Dragon Age, whether it be the Fade separated from the real world by the Vale, or the Deep Road separated from land by thousands of miles of rock. But one place that many players might not know about is the Void. Said to be a location empty and devoid of life, the Void stretches on for eternity in all directions and consumes all, and most scary, no one knows how to get there. Multiple different cultures and people have thoughts about what the Void really is, with the Chantry and Chant of Light arguing that the Void is somewhere between empty spaces in the Fade, and the Elvish teachings arguing that unimaginably deep underground, you can follow the deep roads far enough until you reach it. This has made some in the community begin to speculate that the Void is actually a piece of space-time between the planet we inhabit, and that either by ascending into the heavens of the Fade in the sky, or descending into the hellish darkspawn-ridden deep roads, one can find it meaning the world of Thetis is actually positioned on a sort of loop. And in all of the prominent teachings and religions of Thetis, we hear one thing in common, that in the void lies our eternity. Here lies the abyss, the well of all souls. From these emerald waters doth life begin anew. Come to me, child, and I shall embrace you. In my arms lies eternity. These are the words of Andraste in some of her writings, and it seems to imply that the void plays some sort of significance in Thetis we aren't yet aware of. On top of all of this, we also have some small lore entries in game that mention short-lived Neverin cults that predated the Chantry called the Empty Ones, that supposedly worshipped the Blight itself, and thus the Darkspawn. They exclaim that from the words of an all-knowing being, they had learned the truth of the world, that the Blight originates from the Void itself, and that the suffering it brings is actually our salvation into eternity. Going off of this idea, some prominent theories online actually argue that the Void may be the equivalent of the Fade, but with blood magic, not their traditional forms using Lyrium. As we know, Lyrium is a substance that helps mages and Thetis draw power from the Fade to commit great feats like healing wounds, levitating objects, and releasing fire from their hands. 
Maybe blood magic is a similar idea, where blood is the source from which blight magic can be pulled from the void. Could this mean that the void is actually the antithesis to the fade? Maybe the fade and cause for so much concern in Thetis is only part of the issue, a sort of heaven and hell analogy. But either way, it's hard to say, because the void to this day is one of the least well understood places or even objects in the Dragon Age universe, and there are so many ways the lore could go with this one. In Dragon Age Origins, there's a book titled From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons that many people may have missed, and in this novel we find the following passage. No traveler to the Fade can fail to spot the Black City. It is one of the few constants of that ever-changing place. No matter where one might be, the city is visible. Always far off, for it seems that the only one rule of geography in the Fade is that all points are equidistant from the Black City. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. It was golden and beautiful once, so the story goes, until a group of powerful magister lords from the Tevinter Imperium devised a means of breaking in. When they did so, their presence defiled the city, turning it black. The Black City, previously known as the Golden City, is another massive point of interest in the Dragon Age lore, and for good reason. In the Chantry's teachings, we are led to believe that the Maker originally created the Fade as the first realm of existence, and in this Fade lies a golden and magnificent city, with the Maker at its throne. Whomever was at the seat was the ruler or the gods themselves. But when the Seven Tevinter Magisters teleported themselves into the Fade in physical form, the sin was forever remembered, and the Golden City turned black, and the Blight was released upon the world. Recently though, Bioware released a new cinematic trailer for Dragon Age 4, and in it, Maeve just spun this entire theory and folktale on its head. You see, in this cinematic trailer, there's a short shot of Solus and the Golden City, and the events that took place when Solus imprisoned the Evanurus and the Fade. But wait, something weird happens in this sequence, because as the narrator is remarking about the event, at that exact moment we see the Golden City turn black. In his final fight with the Elven Gods, Solus imprisoned them, and created a veil that split our world from the raw magic of the Fade. Could this be implying that the story we have been told by the Chantry is wrong? Maybe the Golden City was not the seat of the Maker, but rather the Evanuris, and when the veil was cast upon the Fade, with that too the Golden City was decimated. This would perfectly explain why in Chantry lore, those seven Magisters saw nothing when they arrived at the Golden City, because it was not the Golden City at all. Rather, it had already become the Black City, and from its roots the Blight was spreading, the same one that the Magisters brought back with them. If true, this would have extremely far-reaching and massive ramifications for the ancient lore of Dragon Age, and would even tie into the theory that the old gods of Tevinter themselves are the Evanuris, and that humanity has been tricked into following the same gods as the ancient Elven. Either way, it seems clear that Dragon Age 4 Dreadwolf is going to bring us some more answers, and I can't wait to finally learn about this pivotal moment in Dragon Age history. And if you are watching this video far into the future after the game's released, hopefully it did turn out as awesome as this lore implies it could. Sindal might be one of the most lovable characters in the entire Dragon Age series. He originally started out as a sort of joke from the Bioware team, but has grown into something much, much more. But the craziest part is just how sinister this happy-go-lucky kid may really be behind that cherry smile. Back in Dragon Age Origins, a dwarf named Bodan Fedek was searching deep underground in the Attican Taig for treasure when he stumbled upon a very peculiar room, and even more horrifying, a small boy standing aimlessly in the middle, sporting hair pale like marble and clear blue eyes that pierced your soul. In this room were giant marble and gold statues, and strangely, pictures and drawings of ancient and mythical monsters that have never been seen before in lore. Some of them were elven and other depictions of dwarven paragons, which are powerful and mighty ancient dwarves. Bodan ended up taking in the boy as his own and named him Sandal. He was very shy, awkward, and his diction was very unusual. And as time went on, more and more oddities began to crop up. For one, Sandal was very adept with magic as we can see him encase a darkspawn using a rune in Dragon Age 2. But this is especially weird since dwarves usually have no affinity for magic. And this is why many in the community actually think Sandal is actually only half dwarf, with the other half being elven or even a mage. 
This is further supported by the note in game titled Gates of Sagrumar, which reads, I only wish it had not cost you, my only child. I could not build the locked barriers that would carve the marks and break the sigil. You alone could save us, but only by destroying yourself. And I let you do it. Forgive me. Could it be that this note is from a mage in the deep roads that has had to abandon his child Sundal, and this is why Bodan found Sundal standing in that strange room? Other theories posit that this note could actually be from a titan, and that Sundal himself could in fact be part titan, or at least a vessel to carry their will, from deep within the deep roads, walking all of his way to the surface. Things only get weirder too when we account for the fact that Sundal can apparently see the future too, as we know from some of his dialogue in game discussions about the future of Thetis and the prophecy he's seen. One day the magic will come back. All of it. Everyone will be just like they were. The shadows will part and the skies will open wide. When he rises, everyone will see. So was Sundal in fact some sort of fortune teller? And if he is, where did he get these powers? Theories range from the Titans themselves to nothing more than a lyrium overdose, which would also explain why Sundal acts the way he does. But even more demented, some in the community have begun to speculate that Sundal is in fact one of the old gods themselves, potentially one that has been slain as an archdemon in a previous blight, and he has come back to wreak havoc. This is also supported by the fact that many people who Sundal hangs around with see misfortune come their way and would also explain the extensive magic powers he has that seemingly come from nowhere. In fact, this might even explain why a random child was found in a darkspawn infested zone deep, deep underground, all alone, somehow alive, surrounded by ancient artifacts the likes of which we've never seen. Whether or not Sandal is actually a demon, an old god, or some sort of malevolent force though, none of that matters when you have a smile like this. The Dwarven Society in Dragon Age has some of the most fascinating lore entries in the entire series, and the story of their previous and sprawling capital, Kal Sharak, is one of them. Thousands of years ago, on the continent of Thetis, the modern conception of the Dwarven people lived in their heyday. They had multiple underground taigs or settlements, and built many massive structures and roads underground. And the most impressive of these at the time was the capital called Kal Sharak. It was during this time as well that the dwarves first came into contact with the newest inhabitants of Thetis, who had recently founded the Tevinter Imperium and were looking for an ally in their war against the elves on land. To aid in this battle, the dwarves at Kal Sharak made a treaty with the humans that lasted for years, and it was so strong that Kal Sharak was even known to attack other tigs or tribes of dwarves if they ever sheltered elves from war as they were the humans' adversaries. But over time, the Tevinter Imperium started to grow more and more annoyed at the fact that Kal Sharak was so close to their capital, and demanded that the dwarves move their base of operations to Orzammar to the west, and the dwarves conceded and agreed. At the time, there were four great tigs in the Dwarven Kingdom, but none except for Orzammar had an entrance to the surface world, and so now with the capital being moved there as well, it became highly relied upon by all great tigs across Thetis. This became a huge issue though when the first blight finally began, because in order to protect themselves, Orzammar caused a massive collapse of all of the deep roads leading to the other major cities, or Great Tigs, and this included Kal Sharak. And just like that, the people of that Great Tig were doomed to oblivion and death at the hands of the Darkspawn, or so the Dwarven people thought. Because over a thousand years later, signs started to crop up that maybe the long lost and forgotten city of Kal Sharak was still alive and kicking. Dwarven traders on the surface started to appear that had language patterns more similar to the ancient dwarves, not the modern ones most humans on Thetis knew. And in no time, it became clear that these dwarves were in fact from the ancient dwarven capital. We see more proof of this too in Dragon Age Inquisition, where we can receive a mysterious note asking for the Inquisition's help. And if we abide by the note's stipulations while also playing as a dwarven main character, we get this note back. You follow instructions well. Respect of our territory is a first step and better than we expect from a child of the sods in the capital. We aren't kin, but there may be trade. We shall see. But knowing that the dwarves of Kal Sharak did in fact survive over a millennia of war with the Darkspawn and cut off from the surface world gives us more questions than answers. First of all, how has this city been kept such a big secret for so long? 
While in Dragon Age Inquisition as well, we can learn about how different Kalsharok Dwarven traders had in fact been making contact with the surface world for many hundreds of years, but they wore masks and kept their identity and customs a complete secret, focusing on nothing but trading and then leaving without a trace. The question then becomes why so much secrecy though? Why not make their presence more known? And what did they have to hide? Well here comes the horrifying part. Because the bigger puzzle in all of this is how did these dwarves survive for so long deep underground in a city thought gone against the Darkspawn, the greatest threat the world has ever seen? Well, we may just get our answer from a trader on the surface who wrote about an experience he had meeting a dwarf trader that hailed from Cal Chirac, and what he wrote has led to nightmares in the minds of many Dragon Age players since. As curious as I was, there was an undercurrent I found unsettling. I must stress that he and his helpers were professionals and honest throughout, but there was something I can't describe. While he remained hooded the entire time, he looked me square in the eyes when our deal was struck, unashamed. I lived through a time of blight. I felt the gaze of a Grey Warden and seen the corruption of his prey. Why I remembered both in that moment, I still can't explain. Could it be that the dwarves of Cal Chirac are blighted? But if they are, how have they not become like the Darkspawn? Have they somehow figured out how to overcome the taint and the whisper of the song that leads Darkspawn to their bloodshed? The Dwarves of Kalshrok might be holding the answer to how to fight back against one of the most evil forces in all of Thetis, and considering their capital is in the Tevinter Imperium, where Dragon Age 4 will likely take place, sounds like a good as time as ever to figure that out. To me though, the most interesting part of this whole tale is just how a massive society of doors managed to survive on their own and shrouded in such secrecy for so long, and how their culture and customs evolved with it, while also hiding some of the biggest secrets in the whole series that hopefully we get to explore one day. When you think of scary enemies in Dragon Age, the first thing that comes to your mind is probably Emile de la Set. Jesus, he's ugly. But besides that, most of you were probably thinking of the Darkspawn or Demons, some of the most ferocious creatures in all of Thetis that have caused big issues in each game. However, a much less common enemy may be present that most players aren't aware of, that of vampires amongst our myths. In a codex entry from Dragon Age Origins called Demonic Possession, we can learn the following. Why do demons seek to possess the living? History claims they are malevolent spirits, the first children of the Maker, angry at their creator for turning from them and jealous of those creations he considered superior. They stare across the veil at the living and do not understand what they see, yet they know they crave it. They desire life. They pull the living across the veil when they sleep and prey on their psyche with nightmares. Whenever they can, they cross the veil into our world to possess it outright. According to Brahm, the weakest and most common of demons are those of rage. They are the least intelligent and most prone to violent outbursts against the living. They expand their energies quickly, the most powerful of them exhibiting strength and occasionally the ability to generate life. Next are the demons of hunger. In a living host they become cannibals and vampires, and within the dead they feed upon the living. Theirs are the power of draining both of life force and mana. So it's clear then that vampires, or at least a demonic version of them, do in fact live in Thetis, but are seldom actually seen for reasons unbeknownst to us. Also, for anyone interested, the next tiers of demons are Sloth, Desire, and finally Pride, whom are the fiercest of all, with it being said that a greater Pride demon, if brought back across the veil, could threaten the entire world. The world of Thetis in Dragon Age is home to an almost unbearable amount of codex entries, books, and memoirs scattered throughout the lands. And it's because of this that oftentimes players will simply open up a lore entry in game, see it doesn't seem very interesting, and close it after two seconds, knowing how much more information dumps there is to come. In Dragon Age Inquisition specifically, the codex entry titled Request for Resources on the Fade would be one such example, that is nothing more than a list of books about the Fade. But for players that were paying especially close attention, they may have noticed the last two entries in this parchment that may just be hiding the biggest revelation the entire series has ever seen. The first book is titled Elvahan Disfalsis, Traiu Meta Drakas. At first glance, this isn't very helpful as the language is written in what seems like gibberish, but the first word Elvahan is actually very close to Elvanan, which is the Tavine spelling for elves. 
For those of you that don't know, Tavine is the official language of the Tevinter Imperium and relates closely to Latin in our real world. So what happens if we try to convert this book title from Latin to English? Well, the first word we already can assume is Elvin, but we also then can find out that Disfalsis in Latin translates directly into false gods. Now we're getting somewhere. As for the second part of the title, Triu can be substituted for Trae, meaning three, Matad relates closely to Mito, meaning to mow, cut off, or reap, and Dracos most likely relates to the Latin Draco, meaning dragon. And when we put this all together, we suddenly have a title that is starting to make a lot more sense. Elven False Gods, Three Cut Off Dragons. Could this book be a reference to the veil that was created by Solus that somehow cut off the dragons from their power? If your mind isn't blown yet, it's about to get a lot more interesting. Because as we already know from Solus in game, in the Dragon Age Inquisition DLC, the elven gods of the ancient pantheon were most likely false gods that simply gave themselves the title in order to force the lower elves to obey. But what could the book's title mean by the three cut off dragons then? Well, as we already talked about in previous theories on this list, there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that the nine elven gods or Evanurus may in fact be the same deities as the seven old gods in humanity's faith, with the extra two elven gods simply being Solus and Mithal, who later were revealed to not actually be true elven gods at all. So who would this third dragon be then? Could it actually be the author of this book itself? After all, who in Dragon Age's lore otherwise would have known about the Evanuris, Creation of the Veil, vale, and Tavine, all with enough understanding to write an entire novel? Could this mean that there was actually a secret third member of the Evanuris or Elven Pantheon of ancient times that also disagreed with the group? And could this mystery member actually have been a dragon or old god, along with Mithal and Solus, that is playing a massive role in the story we still don't understand? Is it possible that an entire main character of Thetis' entire history has been forgotten and banished from all? And if so, why? What could this now enigmatic figure be hiding? And more importantly, could this figure in fact be the true identity of the one known as the Maker? who apparently holds all power in the universe. It's common amongst Dragon Age theorists to assume that Mithal, Sandal, or Solus is in fact the Maker, or that the Maker itself is nothing but a lie. But maybe there really is a strong force in this ancient story we have yet to be told about, and that force may just be at the center of absolutely everything going on in Dragon Age. And maybe that answer lies in the second book at the end of this Codex entry, which simply reads, Untranslated, Author Unknown. It's crazy to think that the answer to everything in the entire Dragon Age universe may have just been hiding in what on the surface looked like one of the most boring lore entries in game. The Dragon Age series is known for having very high highs, but also very low lows. Depending on who you ask in the community, many fans either love or hate each game and spinoff, with the only exception being Origins being almost universally loved, and this means that the fan base is rife with both copious amounts of love and disdain alike. But one thing that the fans can all agree on is that any new mainline game announcement to the series is a big and exciting moment, and as one of the best-selling RPG franchises of all time, it should be for the entire industry. And that's why the upcoming release of Dragon Age Dreadwolf has so many people excited. But the real interesting discussions center around not when the game will finally release, but instead what it'll actually be about. We already know from multiple rumors and hints from trailers that the game is likely to be set in the Tevinter Imperium, maybe the most interesting zone in all of Thetis, and it's going to be centered around the main villain Solus. For those that don't know, Solus was revealed at the end of the final DLC content for Dragon Age Inquisition to be the famed Fen Harel from the Elven Pantheon. Fen Harel, also known as the Dreadwolf, Lord of Tricksters, and Bringer of Nightmares, was the man responsible for tricking the nine original Evanuris and creating the veil that separated the Fade from the material world. This caused the downfall of the Elves and their leaders and was the main catalyst for the structure of the world of Thetis that we see today. Solus saw his elven god counterparts not as gods, but as beings filled with hubris, many of whom would enslave their less powerful elven brothers and turn them into horrid monsters for sport and fun. But in his attempt to stop this, he also took away the world we knew before, and doomed many spirits to a life of torture. So in the Trespasser DLC for Dragon Age Inquisition, Solus finally reveals his new plans, to take down the veil and thrust the world of Thetis into a new beginning, 
one where the material world and the Fade are as one, just like before. The issue is, this could end up killing all living beings on Thetis today and result in an even more tragic set of consequences that Solus couldn't have predicted. His intentions are pure at heart and make sense, but the actions he is willing to take to potentially right his past wrongs will only make things worse. Which side note by the way is such an awesome villain arc which really gets me hyped for the next game. The real questions though arise around whether or not everything we are hearing from Solus is the truth. After all, we do know that he is the god of tricksters and elven lore, and was able to dumbfound an entire legion of capable adversaries, so maybe everything isn't as it seems. Could Solus be hiding some key facts from us about his real motives and intentions? He is making it seem like he is less sinister than he actually is, or could it be that other forces are at play that we're not yet aware of? As we noted before, considering that Dragon Age 4 is likely set in the Deventer Imperium, this is also the perfect place to dive more into the lore of ancient Thetis and who Solus was and what he did, from sources like the Magisters, not just Solus himself. Where this theory gets absolutely crazy though is when we start to dive into who Solus really is. Because while we already know that Solus is Fen Harel of the Elven Pantheon, what if Fen Harel is actually more than just that? In a passage from the Tevinter Knights books and game, we can read the following. High overhead, where the black city shadowed the sky, I heard a booming roar. But before the Tevinter mage could complete his ritual, the Dreadwolf arrived. It was no elf, no mortal mage. It was a beast unlike any I have ever seen, lupine in appearance, but the size of a high dragon, with shaggy spike hides and six burning eyes like a pride demon. And it came to us on wings of fire that resolved themselves into hordes of lesser demons as the dreadwolf landed before us. But you may be asking, why would Solus or Fen Harel be a dragon or demon? That makes no sense. Well, very unknown but canon amongst the Dragon Age lore is the Dragon Age comic series, The Silent Grove. And it's here we learn about what are called great dragons and dreamers. During the time of the ancient elves, these dragons were said to roam the sky freely due to the unhindered power of the Fade. And from these great dragons lied a blood in the purest of form, that when combined into one's body could make them a dreamer, or a mortal with the ability to shape the Fade in dreams to their will. Sounds very similar to someone we already know, doesn't it? Somebody that somehow had the unbelievable power to create an entire veil to hold back the most powerful force of magic in existence the fate itself. We have another smoking gun too. In some ancient elven writings in game, we can also find the passage that links Solus to all of this. His crime is high treason. He took on a form reserved for the gods and their chosen, and dared to fly in the shape of the divine. The sinner belongs to Durathman. He claims he took wings at the urging of Gilanon, and begs protection from Mathal. She does not show him favor, and will let Elganon judge him. For one moment there is an image of a shifting, shadowy mass with blazing eyes, whose form may be one or many. Then it fades. This would explain why Solus's parting words in Dragon Age Inquisition are that he and only he alone could have created the Veil, because Solus himself is the last of the remaining great dragons or true gods of the world that exist, that has the power to quite literally bend existence around his very will. Solus isn't just the fate god of the ancient elves, but one of the most powerful gods of the world of Thetis itself, living up to his new name as the trickster god all in an attempt to regain lost power. It's one of the most interesting and lesser known theories in Dragon Age, but one I would especially like if it came true, because it's just too cool not to. In Dragon Age Inquisition's Jaws of Hakan DLC, there's a note the player can find locked behind a cell door that reads, Long ago this would have been underwater, until Tevinter drained much of Swamp Kuldstaten to build this prison. Why make a jail so remote? For prisoners they wish to hide. Tevinter has made war on Orle many times, but I now believe there is also a secret war between them that the common people are not allowed to see. This prison is a reminder of this secret war that continues in our time. I speak of Orle's attempt to rouse the snake kings of the earth against Tevinter's alliance with the moon men. This is experienced in Sir Yink's pamphlets, of which I have read many, which explain things such as why the snake appears in Tevinter's drawings and how the snake kings came to exist. Did Moon Men have their Tevinter allies keep the Reptilian ones here so they could interrogate them at their leisure? 
None can say, but I will say yes, as that can fit my theory. While this entry is obviously a funny nod from Bioware to a real world conspiracy theory that talks about lizard people and aliens, it starts to get really interesting when we realize that those snake kings being talked about here could actually be the scaled ones. As we talked about earlier on this list, the Scaled Ones are something that is still up for debate in the Dragon Age universe, but it seems quite clear from many ancient tombs of Dwarven lore inscribed by the Shaperit scholars into memory that they did in fact exist at some point, and may have held immense power. But if this conspiracy theorist did in fact know the truth behind the Scaled Ones, could these Moon Men of Tevinter in fact be real as well? In another note we can find on Rockspit Island, we get more context. The rock spit is an island of great significance. Its sides are steep, but the top is flat, and there are pillars and a dragon statue perched proudly for all to see. Would Tevinters put these items here for no reason? Nay, I believe they were meant to be seen from a great height, for rivers and islands would make a good landmark for a bird's eye. This island is obviously the place where Tevinter first contacted the Moon Men. This would explain why the river was clearly diverted from its original path in the past, as one could see if they follow the old riverbanks. Did Tevinter use the ley lines to do this? Did the moon men fly? Do they look like us, only grayer? Much remains to be discovered. So could it be in fact that the true founding of Tevinter was actually aided by so-called moon men? Maybe the magic and power that the original magisters and humans that migrated to Thetis got was actually some sort of extraterrestrial beings, not the old gods. Or even more likely, this conspiracy theorist may be confusing the old gods with aliens. Or maybe all of the Dragon Age lore and the Chantry have been mistaking aliens as old gods. Could the dragons of Dragon Age themselves actually be interdimensional beings from outer space that are manipulating a world they have stumbled upon? Potentially this could explain how the elves found so much power as well. The Fade, the Void, Lyrium, Titans, what if all of it was nothing more than advanced alien technology that has fallen into the hands of otherwise primitive beings, and because they cannot understand it, they have come up with legends of gods and heroes to make it all make sense? Well here's where things get absolutely crazy. What if the old gods and the maker of Dragon Age are nothing more than the Reapers from the Mass Effect universe, who are indoctrinating humans on the planet far into the future following the events of Mass Effect 3? After the destruction of the Mass Effect relays at the end of the trilogy, humanity would have been sent back into the Stone Ages once again. And some splinter groups may have found themselves on the planet that houses Thetis, where millions of years later, dormant reapers can come back to study the beings that originally bested them in the first place. I'm not high, I swear. Probably the biggest events in the Dragon Age series are Blights. Kicked off whenever Darkspawn find one of the seven old god dragons underground and change them into an archdemon, the Blights consume the world of Thetis and cast humanity into sometimes over 100 years of never-ending and bloody war. That is, until the archdemon is slain. But in the actual series of games themselves, we have only seen one of the Blights, the fifth and most recent. And what's weird about this blight specifically is just how much it differed from any of the previous four. For starters, the previous blights all began under massive and populated towns, meaning when the first darkspawn armies arose from the depths underground, they could quickly attack and cripple major cities of influence and weaken their foes. But for the fifth blight led by the old dragon god Orthemiel, darkspawn originally started appearing far away from civilization in the Kokari wilds. Another example of the weirdness behind the Fifth Blight is that in all previous Blights, multiple large-scale invasions were launched all over Thetis at once, ranging from Orlay to Tevinter and Ferelden. However, once again in the Fifth Blight, only Ferelden was focused on, and even to a lesser extent in terms of the ferocity of the attack. On top of this, the previous four Blights were known to be massively detrimental to the Dwarves, and in fact are the main reason to this day that they are so weakened. But in the fifth blight, that completely changed, and the Darkspawn didn't even touch them, leaving their at the time exhausted capital of Orzammar utterly untouched. And this entire blight and war lasted literally under a year, while being stopped by a brand new recruit to the Grey Wardens, which is crazy considering other previous blights, like the one led by Dumont, carried on for over 120 years non-stop. So what's going on here then? Well, some in the Dragon Age community have begun to speculate that the Architect may have something to do with this. 
You see, in Dragon Age Origins, we learn that the Fifth Blight didn't actually start like the others. The Architect, which was a darkspawn emissary wielding great magics oftentimes theorized to be one of the Tevinter Magisters, had gained sentience and wanted to help his brothers be freed from the taint, and was trying to awaken Urthemiel in order to have him help in this endeavor. Apparently this ritual failed though, and after being awoken, Urthemiel became an archdemon and the Fifth Blight started. Considering how weird the Fifth Blight actually was though when compared to the previous ones, and how much of a failure it truly turned out to be all things considered, could it be that the architect actually did in fact succeed? Maybe Urthemiel purposely released the darkspawn in the Kokari wilds originally and only attacked smaller settlements primarily. After all, this is the sort of strategy you would commit to if rather than causing major damage, you just wanted to establish some sort of foothold in the area. Potentially, Urthemiel's real goals were actually aligned with the Architects, and the Old God did not want to cause tons of casualties like the previous Blights, but instead establish a base of operations and then look for peace. This would also explain why the Dwarves were left completely alone, and also why in Dragon Age Origins specifically when fighting the Darkspawn, they seem so organized. Because maybe they were. Unlike previous Blights where they were nothing but mindless and dangerous husks following the will of the Tainted Blight. This theory flips the entire beginning of the series on its head and shows that maybe the Darkspawn and the Old Gods aren't actually so evil after all, but rather beings that are being controlled by the mysterious Blight. And while there is certainly more to this story going on that we aren't aware of, for sure the Fifth Blight in retrospect should have been a wake up call for many, that something is changing. It's widely been accepted by most of humanity following the Chantry's teachings from the Maker that the Darkspawn originated from the seven Tevinter Magistrates performing a ritual to teleport themselves into the Fade, only to bring back with them a horrid plague that thrusts upon the world of Thetis the First Blight. But what if this actually wasn't the real story? You see, there's a lot of conflicting evidence from other races' histories as well as known facts about the world, like the discovery that many of the Darkspawn are being birthed underground from what are called Broodmothers, which are massive, ugly beasts that spew fluids from every hole in their body while giving birth to whatever race they are, with different Broodmothers being human, elf, dwarf, or Kunari. To get an idea of just how dreadful and rotten these creatures truly are, take a look at what might be one of the most horrifying poems in all of Dragon Age, from a dwarf dwarf named Hespeth singing as she is about to go into battle with a broodmother. First day, they come and catch everyone. Second day, they beat us and eat us for meat. Third day, the men are gnarred on again. Fourth day, we wait in fear for our fate. Fifth day, they return and it's another girl's turn. Sixth day, her screams we hear in our dreams. Seventh day, she grew as in her mouth and they spew. Eighth day, we hate it as she is violated. Ninth day, she grins and devours her kin. Now she does feast, and she's become the beast. Now you lay in wait, for their screams will haunt you in your dreams. So could it be that the Darkspawn did not come from the Magistrates, but rather are just a natural part of Thetis that were always deep underground, that being the Broodmothers and the curse they carry? One especially interesting theory argues that the Darkspawn may have much more in common with their underground companions, the Dwarves, than we thought. After all, we know the Dwarves used to listen to the song it was set, as we hear from Cole in Dragon Age Inquisition's Descent DLC based around finding a still alive Titan, when he notes that it's singing, a they that's an it that's asleep, but still making music. That music is what we hear about in some ancient Dwarven texts, back when the Dwarves and Titans were much more connected. And as we already know, the Darkspawn are consumed by the Blight, but also the Taint, which is a voice and song in their head that instructs them to kill. Perhaps the Darkspawn we see today are actually the Dwarves of old, or simply a new vessel from which the Titans are trying to get payback after the Elves apparently defeated them in a Great War millennia ago. Maybe even the Broodmothers themselves are the Titans or working for them, and all of this magic relates back to them the original owners of Thetis. Either way though, something is for sure going on here with the Darkspawn that we aren't yet aware of, and there's simply too many missing puzzle pieces as to where these creatures truly came from and why they're so prevalent in the Deep Roads. While the lands of Thetis and Dragon Age are no stranger to otherworldly and mysterious creatures that we don't know much about, maybe the most unknown of all of them is the Vex. Briefly mentioned by David Guider, the narrative designer and mind behind the setting of Dragon Age, 
At one point in an interview years ago, he talks about these strange monsters, where he says, a primitive yet sapient race called the Fex has inhabited this island since before the Kunari arrived. So what is he talking about exactly? Well, we know that the Kunari are said to have inhabited Parvalin for at least a thousand years before migrating over to the mainland of Thetis, and it's largely been assumed that humanity also lived on this island at some point with the Kunari before migrating over as well. But could it be that there was also a third potential race that settled there, that being these Vex that David himself has confirmed the existence of? If we take a look back at some ancient lore texts on Parvalin, we may just find some answers. Some scholars believe that the first humans in Thetis came from the rainforest of Parvalin many thousands of years ago, migrating south from the archipelago. The pyramids they built still stand to this day and are regarded by travelers in the region as true wonders. Elven lore also states that humans first arrived in Thetis around minus 3100 ancient from Parvalin to the north. We know more of the pyramids than we do of the humans who built them. Parvalin's distinctive pyramids, looming from the overgrowth, have remained largely intact, even if their intended purpose has been lost. An von Thrastis has observed that the shape of the Parvalin pyramids seems to perfectly match the constellation Solium. So it's clear that some giant and impressive structures and pyramids have been built on Parvolin, and most historians on Thetis seem to think these are from ancient human tribes or even the Kunari, whose ancestors seem to have a much higher level of technology than the rest of Thetis. But could it be that the Vex actually hold the key to this mystery? Let's take a look at another lore entry in game on the Solium, which is the constellation that it was said to perfectly match those Parvolin pyramids. There are two common interpretations regarding the history behind the constellation Solium, commonly referred to as the Sun. The first is that it represents the fascination of early with all objects in the sky, the Sun and Moon in particular. The second interpretation is that this constellation originally represents Elgernon, the head of the elven pantheon who was also known as the eldest of the sun. If we narrow in on their first interpretation, we get more questions and answers. After all, what is the fascination with an early something? Could it be that it means early and lost civilization, potentially that of the Vex? And if that is the case, could that mean that the Vex themselves have some sort of relation to the sun and constellations? and maybe the Evanurus or old gods themselves. An even weirder theory is that the Vex may in fact be the real name behind the scaled ones we spoke about earlier on the list, considering both in lore and data entries date back to the same exact periods of time, it could just be the secret link we're looking for. Amongst the most degenerate in the Dragon Age community as well though, some have begun to wonder if the Vex may in fact be a race of sentient furries, potentially foxes. Why? because I guess it kind of sounds like a furry name. I hate it here. <laughs> the Blight is maybe the most terrifying ephemeral force in the entire Dragon Age series. Its origins, at least based on Chantry doctrine, come from when the Seventh of Intermagisters entered the Fade and approached the Golden City, only to release the Contagion onto the world. But that's just it. First of all, is this story really even true? And second of all, is the Blight in fact a contagion? We know that the Grey Wardens in game perform a ritual in order to gain immunity to the Blight and the Taint, but most interestingly, their methods resemble in many ways a real world sense of vaccination or immunization. We also know that the Dwarves of Kal Shirak have seemingly unlocked this ability to resist, and it implies that the Blight is nothing more than a virus of sorts that turns its host into the darkspawn that fight under the will of the Song and Taint. This is also what causes some Lyrium in the game to be turned into red or blighted Lyrium, as it becomes infected with the same substance that turns living beings into monsters. But if the Blight really is a sort of contagion or chemical weapon, where does it come from? Well, considering as far as we can tell from all accounts it was locked behind the veil in the Fade, maybe the Blight itself is some sort of ancient, purposely created bioweapon. We know that during the time of the ancient elves in Evernurus, the elven pantheon also consisted of a mysterious and unknown set of figures called the Forgotten Ones. And in some lore texts throughout the series, some connections between these Forgotten Ones and the Void specifically have been called out maybe the Blight itself actually originated in some part from the Void, and the Forgotten Ones of the Elven Pantheon were able to tap into it in some way to then pull the Blight weapon into the Fade or Realm of the God Elves at the time. 
This would mean that the Blight was actually originally a way to take down the Elven ruler's reign, and potentially could even be a secret reason for why Solus created the Veil in the first place that he hasn't mentioned, in order to not only take away the power of the Evanuris, but also to hold back the Blight that would have destroyed the world. This would also explain how the Blight transforms old gods into archdemons, because if those old gods are in fact the Evanuris or Forgotten Ones, then the Blight having such a drastic effect would make sense, considering it would have been engineered or formed from the Void with that exact intention. Maybe the Blight and the calling or taint it produces for those infected is nothing more than an ancient and forgotten massively powerful bioweapon forged in the ether of the Void, that when overpowering a host transforms their mind to be fixated on the call of its song and will. A song and will that may just in fact be the Forgotten Ones or the original creator of the Blight, slowly transforming the world to do their bidding from behind the scenes in a master plan that is now taking shape over thousands of years. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I put a ton of time and effort into these massive theory and lore videos, and I really appreciate all the love and support you guys have been showing over the past couple of months. And if you want to help me on future theories and lore, make sure to join the Discord or follow me on Twitter or on Instagram to hear more about my personal life. All of those links should be in the description below. And make sure to check out my second clips channel as well if you want more bite-sized versions of what I do on the main channel here. As always guys, have a great day and see you next time.